Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Tech Salescraft with me, James Hounslow, and I am absolutely delighted that we've got Liam Corcoran with us today, who is the general manager and EMEA uh, of uh, Byte Plus. Um, Liam, um, you've got a great career, and it's it's really good to have you on board to talk us through a lot about what you've learned along the way. And um, I can never do it uh, as much justice. So, as a way of getting started, would you mind giving the audience a bit of a background as to who you are? Yeah, so um, I've been in sales, sales leadership uh, for probably more than 17 years now. Uh, back in 2005, I founded my own company. It was called uh, Q Research. Uh, we founded that with uh, Liz Nelson, uh, who was the founder of Taylor Nelson Softwares, uh, one of the biggest uh, market research companies uh, globally. Um, so we helped to launch uh, mobile market research as a platform. Um, as a service, uh, which is obviously later yeah. now morphed into uh, a lot bigger industry than uh, when we first uh, launched the company uh, back then. So if we knew then what we know now, uh, we probably would have stuck at it a little bit yeah. longer. <laughs> but we had we had good success. And, you know, we grew that business over a period of four years uh, before uh, selling that to to another business. Um, I then moved on to uh, two further early stage uh, businesses, helping to set up new divisions uh, within those companies. And then after that, uh, I went into a corporate uh, and helped to, to set up a, a new advertising uh, measurement business within that uh, organization, helped to re-pivot it into the marketing services space uh, and to grow that organization. Uh, and now, uh, pretty similar uh, at Byte Plus is, again, going into a quasi-corporate startup and establishing a new business, again, from the ground up uh, within the EMEA region. So I think very much my strengths are in trying to take businesses from nothing and yeah. turn them into, into something, hopefully, that can then continue to scale and be successful going forward like it um so when did you first decide that sales leadership might be something that a you're interested in and b you might be quite good at in my mind I've, i was never thinking about going into sales leadership mm. uh, i think when we started the company back in 2005 i always knew that i wanted to run my own business uh, and when the person at the time came to me and was thinking, you know, he wanted to do the same thing. He was thinking of ideas of how we could set up a, a business. And, uh, you know, going into to market research, we kind of fell into that. And therefore, you then fall into sales. Mm -hmm. And then because you're then running the company, you then fall into kind of leadership. Mm -hmm. So it was nothing that I ever planned to go into kind of that leadership. But I always knew that I wanted to to, to run my own business. And then I guess... From there, it's just kind of morphed into uh, the kind of direction, the journey that I've gone uh, forward in. So when you started this business, have you ever done um, sales before um, or leadership before doing this? I did. So I think I, I kind of learned uh, the very tough route into sales. I think my first job was working for door-to-door -door sales company. Yeah. So we were selling uh, alarm systems like it uh, in, in london so it was a case of knocking on as many doors as you possibly can to try and get people to allow you into their homes to to, to sell them an alarm system on the front of their house <laughs> um so i think that was that was extremely tough uh, a good environment to learn how to sell how to get people to engage with you and obviously build those relationships and then buy from you and then after that, I went into, which was telesales. So selling online ads. Uh, so hundred dollars a day, yeah. trying to get the CEO onto a call. Uh, and in those days, it was trying to send over the fax, get them to sign it and then send it back to you and pin the deal up on the wall. <laughs> uh, so again, you know, very tough, you know, mm. trying to get through the gatekeepers, trying to get through to the right decision maker, trying to convince them to buy from you there and then over the phone without having any kind of face-to-face -face interaction, which again, you know, it hardens you up uh, yeah. from a sales perspective. Like it. So um, 
you launched this um, new business. Um, what was your plan um, on day one for, for growth and how did you create the plan? Well, I think back then I was extremely naive. Mm -hmm. um, so there wasn't really a business plan. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, again, you know, looking back now, if uh, with the knowledge that I've had now, I probably would have, we would have, I would have positioned the business in a different way than, than what it was, what it ended up being. Uh, now that I see the value and now I see where the real opportunity could have potentially been. So I guess the business plan at the very early days was, I would say it was very agile. It was, you know, we were making it up as we, as we kind of went along, trying mm. to look for different opportunities, trying to find a way to generate revenue mm. uh, for that particular business. And it wasn't until later on that, you know, we started to really sit down uh, and start to formulate uh, a business plan and what the next couple of years was going to look like and what we were aiming to achieve. Interesting. So how far in were you before you decided that you needed to, to sit down and, and really plan this and how much um, roughly kind of revenue had you generated to that point? Uh, I think it probably took us somewhere between you know, self seven to 12 months yeah. before we got to that stage. I think the very early stages was trying to get uh, investment into the business, mm -hmm. trying to get people who had knowledge and experience of the market to buy into uh, the business, you know, be be part of uh, the board. Mm -hmm. And then we needed to use that money to actually build the technology, build the platform uh, in the first place. And then it wasn't until we had that platform developed, tested, uh, working well, were we then going out and trying to to win uh, customers. Yeah. But I suppose experience tells me now is that we we were you know very much test and learn. Uh, we we hadn't got to product market fit at that point because we were still trying to determine. Uh, what were the right companies to go after? You know, who should we be having conversations with? How do we go about generating kind of repeatable, consistent revenue? Mm -hmm. So we're still trying to find our sweet spot a little bit uh, mm -hmm. of what works, what didn't work. Um, and then once we were able to hone into a certain types of companies, you know, that's where we, when we started to kind of generate uh, more consistent revenue uh, for the business. Like it. Um, how did you decide uh, for other first time founders um, who might be listening? How did you decide when was the right time to add to the commercial team to 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 sell? Once you're going through building a product, you're trying to work out product market fit. You're trying to get pricing right. When did you decide the trigger point was to to get help in to um, to do it? Well, back then, uh, it was very much uh, revenue led. So mm -hmm. the more revenue we could bring in, then it enabled us to go out and be able to, to hire people, uh, which is a total different approach to the company that I'm in now. Yeah. So now it is almost the role reversal is that revenue isn't important. It's actually trying to hire as quickly and to grow as fast as we possibly can. Yeah. In order to be able to then bring the revenue in. Yeah. So it's throwing bodies, throwing product into the market, see what sticks, try and once you've found out what sticks, then it's about trying to generate as much revenue against that product as we possibly can and, and scale the business from there. So it's very from where I started to where I am now, the approaches are totally uh, opposite. Interesting. Um, and so I'd be interested to see the, the the types of people that you were hiring in, in in that environment. Did you put much thought process into character against experience, or was it we've got to try and convince people back then to come in and uh, join a startup? Yeah. So back then, um, again, uh, it was probably too naive. Is that I didn't have a hiring framework. You know, yeah. Now in the role that I have, I have a hiring framework. I know exactly the types of individuals that I'm looking for. But, you know, back then it was, who could we find that we knew mm -hmm. that could come in and, and help us? Uh, how could we leverage uh, some of the investors within the business 
to uh, identify people that they knew or they worked with that would be good uh, for our business at the current stage uh, that we were in. But I think as in, again, you know, the from experience is given the stage of business is dependent on the types of people or the right types of people to bring into your business at that particular point. So, you know, the mistakes that we made in that we're bringing two experienced people, two uh, senior people into the organization that hadn't uh, been involved in early stage businesses. Uh, they were used to businesses where all the processes, the procedures were in place, uh, all that kind of getting your hands dirty, trying to solve problems, figure out what worked, what didn't work. You know, they didn't have that knowledge. No. They were used to going into organizations where it was already set up and it was almost given to them on a plate. So I think quickly you kind of learn that you need a different type of individual to come in at that early stage who, who's really good at uh, executing, uh, but also aren't afraid to problem solve and get their hands dirty and just get whatever needs doing done so that we can start to move forward uh, and start to you know get revenue coming through the door. I like it. So um, you you mentioned and with everything, right? Hindsight is a is a wonderful thing for uh, for everybody. Um, but if you were starting that business again tomorrow, what key learns that have you taken out from it that that people could um, listen and uh, and take? Particularly as you kind of bootstrapped it, rather than taking huge amounts of seed funding, which um, and Series A funding, which I think. You know, if you listen to uh, the noise out there at the moment, a lot of that's going to kind of dry up and not be so readily available. So if you were to run it again, um, bootstrapped, what did you what would you do differently? Uh, I think, first of all, I think you need to understand the problem that you're trying to solve uh, within the industry. Um, so really understanding the market that you're selling into. What are the challenges? What are the pain points? What are they struggling at? As everyone talks about is having a clear mission and vision for the organization, but know your value proposition. Mm -hmm. So, and build that business about doing one thing extremely well uh, and having a clear direction that you want to head in. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, it still might morph into other directions depending on where different opportunities take you, but I think you need to have that kind of clear plan. Mm -hmm. um, and then from you need to then, you know, break it down into phases, you know, step by step. You know, I talked to the uh, the sales team uh, that I'm working with right now is that we stop looking at the big outcome, looking at the big goals that we're trying to achieve and start to break it down step by step. And then, you know, it's just getting through those individual phases in order to be able to achieve that outcome and get to uh, where you want to head to. Uh, with that particular business so yeah pragmatically you know it's having more structure having more of a plan having more of a vision uh, and then starting to really break it down into small steps and trying to execute against them like it um so you are in a um a small group of people who have founded a business and seen uh, an exit the figures are scary when you look at the amount that don't it makes you wonder why so many people start businesses um but you always wanted to start a business you did it you had success you built it you sold it why didn't you do it again uh i think i think once you have done it i don't think anyone appreciates how hard it really is and it i think i was single back then yeah so <laughs> you can dedicate more time and hours to uh, making it successful uh, i think you, you, i think once you've done it once you probably it's probably not good or healthy for you to, yeah. to go on and do it again and there's no i think there's obviously no security either no it's a it's a tough world um for sure um and look it's it's great to see where uh that there's been some success along the road there for you so um really interesting to 
move on you spoke about the hiring framework that you that you've got there and you know, one of the biggest things at the moment there's so much hiring um going on across the globe for salespeople. uh one of the biggest things that sales leaders we always say they like to get hiring right more often um uh, and you mentioned you've got a framework um there is this a framework that you take with yourself wherever you go or is it a framework that you build in a particular organization based on what that company um is like uh so it's it's what i've kind of uh taken with me um and what i use for hiring for the majority of the roles uh within within the business right now so uh, i think there's there's only four elements to it uh, and I can, it's, it's basically knowledge, you know, what do they know? Uh, so how much they know about the industry that we're trying to sell into, how much they know about, uh, you know, the product, uh, mm -hmm. for example, uh, the competition, uh, what the challenges are within the market for the companies that we're trying to sell to. Uh, it's about skills. So what have they been taught? So there's, you know, their sales processes, uh, sales methodologies, how they're good at negotiating, handling objections, uh etc uh what are their kind of uh intrinsic characteristics mm. so do they have drive you know curiosity and you know, i think curiosity is probably the most is the key thing uh certainly in sales it's about asking questions it's about really getting into the detail and wanting to truly understand what the problems are and what and how you can um, help them to to overcome it um, and are they good problem solvers? Certainly at this stage or early stages of businesses, you are going to have loads of problems. Mm -hmm. So you need good people that can help solve those problems, but not be phased uh, by the problems either. Yeah, it's interesting. How did you come about building this framework? How far in, how many mistakes did you make before you realised actually, I've got to stop going off gut feeling or stop going off someone's black book or someone's last performance? Well, I think it's one is uh, when I came into the, the 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 company that I am now is seeing people that were hired at the wrong stages of the business. So they've come from some of the biggest tech companies, but obviously they they came into those tech companies when most of the processes, procedures, products were well established. Um, so you learn quite quickly that actually they don't have the skills. Mm -hmm. and the experience to handle working in an early stage environment so you kind of then build the framework okay well what am i trying to look for what is the ideal person mm -hmm. that can come in at this stage and help us to be successful and i think the characteristics i think is the number one if they've got the right mindset they've got the right drive you know they are problem solvers um they are curious uh, they're not afraid of chaos mm -hmm. and and they're not afraid of, you know, things constantly changing as well. They can handle change. Yeah. So I think you start to identify those are the key skills that you're looking for within an individual. And then when you layer that on with uh, knowledge as well as experience and they have been good at executing uh, as well, then I think that's when you're starting to find the right people that will thrive in this environment at this stage and i think that is and i can start to see that being proven out by uh the individuals that i now have in in my team as well yeah um it's really i, I love this uh framework you got there and it kind of marries up with all the key things you should be be looking for here's the difficult part that a lot of people find though how do you ask the questions in the interview to identify those because a lot of people will just stick to a cv and start asking questions around a cv so two points to that how do you get the right questions to answer those and do you have specific interviews where people are looking for certain things and do you delegate out to other people or do you are you homing in for all of those um, four areas uh so the way the interview process right uh works right now is i'm the last stage interviewer mm -hmm. so i'm the first one to review the CVs that come through. Okay. Um, so I will approve or reject them based on, do they have, looking at their CV, do they have the right skills and experience that I'm looking for uh, within the business? And then I get other people within the team to interview those individuals first. So if they feel 
that they they could be the right fit mm -hmm. plus they've got the knowledge the skills and the experience then they push them forward um so i get different people within the team so they probably go through a four stage process uh, all together so for me initially reviewing uh, and yeah. then they go to two people within the team and then they come to me and then i will uh, based on the feedback that the other individuals have provided within the team it then gives me a good understanding of maybe where the gaps are mm -hmm. or what points we haven't asked them within the interview process and then for me it's okay so they meet the skills they've got the knowledge they've got the experience and then all i'm trying to get out of them is their characteristics how will they be able to cope working in this type of environment would they see it as a challenge or you know will they see that actually it's going to overwhelm them or maybe it's not the environment for them so i think you have to be very open and honest very transparent about what kind of environment they're coming into what the expectation is going to be what they're going to be accountable for and then really is is, is saying to them do you you know do you see yourself in this type of environment do you think this is an environment that you're going to thrive in do you think this is where you're going to be successful? Because if you're not, then this isn't going to be the role for you. So do, do you have, you don't um, get a presentation or anything involved at the end stage for you? Is that's, that's something you don't believe in or, or use? Yeah, we ha actually, I think that I've used that a few times. So for some people that I'm unsure about, mm -hmm. but other people in my team are extremely positive about that individual we'll then move them to a kind of present state, uh, presentation stage. And actually, I think that has been a real key uh, eye-opener mm -hmm. because at some point they had everything you were looking for. You know, they had a good relationship, but then when you see them present for the first time, you think, okay, yeah, actually, yeah, uh, uh, I think you're going you're gonna to struggle. The hardest one is the solution cell. Um, and trying to work out that someone is a um, a problem solver. I had somebody um, uh, on the on the show from uh, from the US about twelve months ago, and at one of the latter stage of interview, they they give a brain teaser, not to see if they can get the brain teaser right. It's how they attack it. Um, do they ask questions, right, or do they sit there and just try and work it out for themselves, or do they bring people in? She's then looking for people to ask good questions and to have a go and to not give up. But if they can't do it in the end, bring someone in and just say, I can't do it. But a brain teaser on its own takes about an hour outside of the uh, the interview. So it takes up a lot of time. And in a world where things are a lot more remote now, there's challenge there. But is it, have you got a, a particular way that you dig into to understand if someone is a problem solver? Because the one thing that we know is that you've, to survive in this world you want a product that is a need not a want um, and if it's a need you are solving a problem um, and you've got to be able to do that so is there a particular way that you dive in to find out if these people have what it takes to solve um, problems rather than saying I've got tech that's going to change your world just have a look at it I think it is it's it's kind of situation based so it's giving them you know specific situations that we have personally come up against uh, and experienced and yeah. just really trying to understand their kind of thought process uh, around how they would go about tackling that particular yeah. situation yeah. so what would they what would they start with you know and where would they where would they end up and to see whether do they get to the same outcome that we got to yeah or actually they they they, they actually end up with a unique position that we haven't even thought of yeah because i think if they get into that stage then you're like okay you know this person can be can think creatively yeah. around how to tackle uh the problems that you know we are facing on a day-to-day -day basis right. i guess they're the types of people because i'm not going to have the answer to everything i'm not going to have the solution to everything so if I can get other people that can chip in with other other ideas and other ways of um, trying to address that problem, then that's only going to benefit us. And they're the types of people that we're probably looking for. 
Absolutely. And so through that conversation, I guess you're, you're again looking for them to ask questions about it, get more detail around it, um, and then come up with um, uh, ideas to, to fix it, like it. Um, well, I think that's the curious stage. That's the bit about yeah. them being curious. It's not just accepting of what's being said to them, but actually yeah. want to delve a little bit deeper, understand it better, and therefore they can then come up in, with a solution on how they're going to tackle the problem. Like it. Now, one of the things I always come across with um, with great sales leaders when we talk about getting hiring right more often, one of the key things that often comes up is that actually we get hiring right more often than we than we think, and we don't give ourselves enough credit for it. Where it drops down is onboarding and that first twelve months out the other side of the coaching and the development of of individuals. How important do you put the onboarding part and what's the process that, that, that you have in place to, to try and make sure that success, it's never a given, but you give the best platform that, that you have to enable something to uh, work or fail quicker than it does. Because, you know, they normally will stay for about 12 months before um, they either go or you choose to exit someone who hasn't worked out. Um, but is there a particular onboarding process that you have or you have with your team yeah, so we've recently, we've just been going through revising our whole onboarding process. Like um, and actually, I want the team to kind of keep feeding into the onboarding process based on their own experience. How can we yeah. improve it? How can we get it better? How can we get it more effective? Um, so we have clear a uh, clear onboarding process mm. on you know what what does day one look like what does you know week one look like what does you know month one uh, look like and I think the key thing is about trying to get people to gradually uh, work their way into the into the team try not to put too much pressure on them get them give them the opportunity to really uh, meet people across the organization. Uh, try and learn as much as they possibly can. And then I run this thing where at the end of every single day, I ask them to summarize what they've learned. To send me every day, what have you learned from that day? What have you done and what have you learned? Uh, and where do you need help? And what questions do you have? And then my commitment to them is basically to answer those questions. Or if I can't answer the questions, I will point them in the direction of people around the business who can help answer those uh, questions for them. So one reason why I do that is, one is I think, again, it feeds into the kind of curiosity bit, yeah. is that they're asking questions, which is, I think is good. And I think they're gonna learn quicker by, uh, if they don't understand, they wanna ask a question, I yeah. can give them an answer rather than having to go and find the answer or search through documents for, for the answer, which isn't, isn't efficient or a, a great um, use of their time. But also, if I can, if they, if I don't have the answer, I can then direct them to the right person who will give them the answer. And it means that they're then building more effective relationships across the organization as well. So they're meeting people, you know, talking to them, getting the, getting the uh, answer to the question they need. So hopefully they're learning faster, bedding themselves in, building relationships, getting to grips with the organization. And then hopefully, you know, they're ready to, to start having an impact. For how long do you, as a, a new person on board, do you get them to to send you that? Because you can end up with a lot of questions every yeah. day. Right? Yeah, I don't, it's, uh, uh, I kind of regret sometimes uh, asking them to do that. Uh, yeah. It's, I then got to find the time. Yeah. Because uh, my commitment to them is that the next day I'll come back to them with answers. But yeah. Uh, to start with, I was doing it for two weeks. I've now shortened that down to one week because yeah. two weeks is, is too much. But it just means I think by by after one week, they have now started to know quite a few of the people across the organization. And they know that where they can go to to find answers if they want to understand our process, our products, our procedures in a bit more detail. Like it. Um, so we've now reached that stage where you can ask me anything you ever wanted to ask a recruiter uh, I don't know what it is uh, I'll do my best to uh, answer it um, uh, so shoot this is your chance to uh, ask me anything uh, I think the the kind of key question is when you are putting candidates forward uh, for roles do you feel obliged to put candidates forward or are you really trying to match the right candidate 
with the right role? What a great question. Um, and I think the, the honest answer to that will depend on the relationship you have with that client. And what I mean by that is if it's an organization where they've got um, six or seven other recruitment agencies working a role, they've got a big internal team, it will be matching words on a CV that, that look fit to um, to go in. Where you'll get more time is, you know, based on the fact that there's exclusivity, minimal other people involved, you know, the biggest parts of members recruiters are also salespeople, right? They only get paid if you hire someone. And I think a lot of that gets forgotten that we don't send an invoice until the day someone starts. Um, and that's when, when we get paid on contingent recruitment. So therefore, um, if you've got a relationship um, and you've got a greater chance of filling that role, that's when you're going to get more of the time and the consultant would go in there. But we, we, the bottom line is, is that more often than not on our side, we definitely want to put the right people into the right roles um, that are going to stay. Um, and that's both looking at skill set and characteristics of, of where they are. So if you take on the right opportunity um, with the right leadership, you can absolutely match it up. And we are just we, we are looking to put the right people in there. Um, and um, if you've got the right setup, you know, we look for people to trip up in interview processes rather than trying to puppeteer people through an interview process to get to an offer. So, yeah, so if if you, you know, my advice is don't don't take on loads of agencies because at that point the agency wants to puppeteer because it's the first one to get to the offer. That's basically where it becomes. It becomes my race against the other agencies to get the right um, person that's going to get an offer rather than the right person that is is going to be successful yeah and i was going to say so you asking me about my framework do you have a framework to be able to match the right candidate to the right roles and not feel like you're pressured in putting candidates forward because they want to go after that particular role yeah so so we will only take on a role after doing what probably you guys would best describe as discovery call so so we won't take on a role if we can't work with the hiring manager and we get to sit down with the hiring manager and talk through what we uh, need to understand is why you're hiring um what you what you're looking for in a person um character um against skill set and then we've got to really look at why somebody particularly in this day and age why is someone going to join the business what where are you going and then the other big thing is that what people they always what gets talked about a lot is that somebody will leave a leader, but what people always forget is that someone also chooses a leader um, to join um, over uh, a product that might be better or uh, more more ready, particularly if you're talking around the startup world. Um, so really understanding about the leader and getting every every bit of detail um, around through that. So we spend about an hour um, getting all that information. Then we use that information to firstly make sure that we we know the types of people that will go out and build into our project um and then we'll know we'll use the all the different ways when we're talking about the different types of characters that we're looking for you know some people would like to go into real detail around the fact that you've got the young color wheel where you've got the reds the blues the greens the yellows and it's like right now i've got two screaming reds i don't need another one of those um so you know is trying to, to to get it to the to the right um platform um so so yeah the more information that we can get that means that the candidates that we're putting forward are more likely to go through the process not more likely to get an offer like one cv one offer but the cvs are going to get an interview and you don't need a an army of cvs to be able to um, to make a choice but that comes down to the detail that you can get from the organization and the time they're willing to give to it because that also tells you a lot um about how important the role is or how important the leader gives to these people that are coming on board is the fact that they're willing to sit down and talk about it all um we then challenge it um and the biggest bit that we would always do is say look in that conversation, I'm going to challenge it just to provide some thought process. When I say, right, this is what we're looking for. It's going to work. It's like, why? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Why wouldn't this work? Why wouldn't that work? So they were absolutely um, nailed on that we're looking for the right person. And, you know, because a lot of the time um, leaders will have an idea in their mind and it'd be like, that person's not going to join you. I know, I know why you want that. Um, and it would be great, but 
we could be looking for a long time before that person actually arrives and is available. And if this is an urgent role to fill, then this is what we need to, to look at and do. And sometimes actually on that point, we've had to kind of split the role into two because actually to try and find those types of individuals are almost impossible. Yeah. Uh, um, so it's kind of dividing the role up and make yeah. it easier to be able to get that combination of individuals that can do what you need uh, more effectively. But because they've got different skill sets, then yeah, you need to kind of yeah. split it two. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Have you often wondered why candidates have been put forward to you or um, candidates not coming through? Yeah, because you always wonder what the motivations are, you know, not only from the recruiter, but also from the individual uh, that that's uh, that's applying for the role. Yeah. And so do they have the right motivations. You know, are they just wanting a role or is this the, actually the right role, the right business for yeah. them at their current stage of what they're looking for? Yeah. Uh, so it's very hard to get, you know, to, to make sure that the motivations are right in the first place. Yeah. So so one of the key things from from our side, we will speak to somebody um, about the opportunity, uh, and which is why we try and, you know, arrow in to the exclusivity or, or limited amount of people, in, because we, we then send them away and say, right, go away, think about it and then come back to us um, if you want to go forward for it and then why you want to go forward for it. Um, so there is that thinking time before most leads will tell you that um, who've worked with us is that we get the sell absolutely right. Um, and which is really important for the engagement part right now is actually right. This is, this is why we need to do it. And it makes that first conversation um, much better because the the candidates are really bought in, particularly now when they're like, well, I've got four other opportunities going on. Why, why should I choose you? Um, and, and that's kind of been the bit, the bit of the problem. Like before a lot of people's first interview uh, question was like, uh, why should we hire you? Um, now it's the, the sales leader going, this is why you need to, to come here and this is what you need to do it. Because they ask why, uh, why, why should we hire you? And he's like, I don't know, James called me up and said, you're a great guy and so I should have a conversation. Um, and that's just so awkward of where that first interview but it happens so much um still even now and that's why it's important for us to say right this is the opportunity this is the leader this is the business this is where they're going this is why we think you should do it go away think about it then come back to us um and we'll and we'll put you forward um and normally the next day they'll come back and they'll be like yes because they've got all the information like people just particularly salespeople, they're normally constantly looking for information um to make a decision on um, and if we give it to them all at the front end, they're engaged, we can then get things moving. But I almost kind of like lay it out for them and say, look, this is what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. You know, this is where we are. Is this something that you would yeah. like to be a part of? Yeah. Do you feel you would be able to you know, be successful uh, yeah. in this type of role in this organisation? Yeah. And they say yes. And then we say, why? Yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah. why what do you think going to add yeah. yeah what's it going to be and then we dive in you know it's it's you know it's open the car bonnet um and then you listen to the answers and then you question the answers it's it's yeah. the same as the discovery call we do with you around the job detail the same the qualification on the um on the candidate side of it um absolutely as well because a lot of people will say they want to do a startup um because they like oh brilliant um i'll get some equity um, it'll be really good. It's like you, you do realize that you probably won't, you're a salesperson, you probably won't realize it. Like a lot of people, like you see people earning lots of money from it, but it's so few. Um, and then you say, right, this is what you need to do. And it's like you do realize that they've got an SDR, but you're probably going to need to do a lot of outbound stuff yourself. Um, there's no logo. So people don't know who you are when, when they answer the phone. There's no um fleece when you turn up because they're not a series a yet so they haven't got enough money to uh to buy branded uh bits and pieces so um you know you, you can dig down you can quite really so actually do you know what you're probably better suited for series c series d not a series a um but that all comes down to having deep qualification of these people and understanding their motivations and what they're looking to get out of stuff and when you talk about motivations the the uh I always ask people like, what do they want to do? You know, like in four or five years time, yeah. um, etc. And they all, you know, a lot of people turn around and say, oh, I want to be a leader. 
Yeah. And I'm like, do you really? Yeah. Do you actually understand what it takes yeah. or what's involved and you know the you know the level of work, commitment, etc. Uh I'm sure if if you once you get into that role, you'll probably think, no, 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 I, I want to be an individual contributor yeah. contributor. I don't want to be a leader. I don't want to be looking after, you know, people and managing organizations. I just want to be getting great and doing my role extremely well. Yeah. That's saying, and, 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 you know, we, we talk, let's say we're talking to candidates every day and they say, you know, what, what's the opportunity and, you know, can we get through to, to leadership um, side of it? And it's like, look, you just need to go there and, and, and do your bit. And, you know, what will be, will be um, yeah. organizations will grow if you're successful at your job. Um, opportunities will always um, arise um, but I would nearly always say the best sales people don't tend to make the best sales leader it's not always but I would I would um, hang my coat on that peg um, and the best sales people um, will don't necessarily realize the hit you'll take on salary to start with to, to get up to um, up to speed um, and and look that you know you can't tire everybody with the same brush, but you know when you look at out and out top performing salespeople year in year out, they're normally very selfish um, and normally think about themselves. Um, not a good sign, not a good characteristic of a leader. Um, so um, so yeah, so it's it's normally sort of like walking through why you want to do that and realizing that um, you can actually out earn, and most um, sales leaders will be out earned by salespeople. Um, if you've got good salespeople in there. Um, and also that's something that good salespeople can't normally uh, take. They want to they they earn more money because Joe and their teams earn more money than them. It's like, well, they've hit their target you, you know, <laughs> and they've got accelerators. So it's, 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 it's conversations we have, um, we have daily. And I have the same conversations with SDRs as well because SDRs, uh when i ask them you know they all want to get promoted they all want to go into an a role and i'm like but you're a great hunter yeah just because you're a great hunter doesn't mean you're going to be a great closer so what, do you want to stick at doing what you know and what you've got really great at yeah. doing really well or do you want to now go in and be like a, an ae and be a closer but have to learn you know kind of your whole craft from scratch again yeah so so social media um I, I personally believe social media has basically kind of set SDR as a footstep into AE um, rather than saying it could be a career completely in its own. It's such a vital part of organization. Yeah. But when people are going in, they're like, there's such a fight for SDRs now. It's like, which, you know, can be particularly if it's kind of like mid market, but if it's enterprise, not a chance. You know, if it's proper enterprise selling, there's nothing that you can learn in that period of time, which is going to set you up to be successful. And all you end up doing is creating a hole. And then if you start promising this stuff, it doesn't happen. The other problem you have is other companies then come in and try and nick SDRs because they can't hire AEs. Um, and it's like, well, let's just get an SDR who's been doing it for about 12 months somewhere else. So a lot of people have just been talking about, right, come in, understand it, get some success, and then we'll move you into an AE role. So it gets, the whole role gets devalued, but it's such a valuable part of the organization, but it just, it's been devalued all over social media. Um, and with organizations going, uh, right, I can't find an AE within this, uh, because people get too industry specific and they go, right, let's just go and take um, an AE because they get our product. Um, and they've been talking to people, but they've never closed. And so you're not really solving a problem. All you're doing is put an SDR into an AE role, but you filled your headcount, um, which seems to be more of a thing that people are trying to do at the moment um, because they've taken big amounts of funding um, on it. But I, I think companies should look at saying, look, th this is a really good function. You can get paid really well for doing really well. None of this nonsense about automating it all and, and whatnot and not needing it. But it's it's about saying this is this is why you're an SDR, this is what your skill set is, this is why you need to stick in and do it. Yes, you can and and we'll be able to develop in time, but from day one it shouldn't be about when am I going to be an AE. Yeah. And it's also when they when they get great at their role as an S SDR, it's like then how do you get them to help other people to become great SDRs rather than moving them out yeah. of that role uh, and then having to, you know, uh, coach and progress yeah. the, the SDRs in the team when, you know, for me personally, 
you know, the way that I used to go and do prospecting, it's totally different the yeah. way that you know, prospecting happens right now. I don't have the skills and the knowledge and the experience. Yeah. You know, they have the experience. Yeah. So they need, you know, how do I can I leverage them to help train and coach and develop other people within the team rather than move them into uh, another role where they, they're going to have to then be coached and yeah. developed uh, and trained within that role. That's it. And, and you know, as, as it's business is business as well, you know, and if they do come through and there isn't something there, then you know, their time in the business is done. You know, a lot of people think that you want people to be there for life, right? That's not going to happen anymore. There's too much opportunity out there. They, you know, you, you, you look at grandparents and they probably stayed at the same company all their working life. Um, then you've got parents who probably had one or two. Um, the, the, the statistics of, of what um, the latest generation of children um, and the, the different amounts of jobs they're going to have is huge. So to think that someone's coming in and you've got to map out this, this career plan for 2030, let's just get you good at what you are. Let's have you enjoy it. Let's get you developing. And you know what? If we can't offer it, see you later, right? Yeah. We've done well. We've done you. We've got you to here. You want that. We can't offer you that. We're not just going to try and do it. Um, good luck. Off you go. And then we'll bring the next person in um, through to do it. But um, but yeah, it's it, the the... the the stigma around SDR at the moment of such a crucial, crucial um, part of the sales funnel um, is to get to AE as quickly as possible because they all earn 300,000, which isn't true. You know, it's so, like you see people like putting up on like, get to an AE, be a, be a good senior AE and you're earning 300,000. Like, it's just absolutely not true. Um, you yeah. know, you know, I do speak to people each day who are earning five, 600,000. But, you know, it's I'm not not everybody's earning this 300,000 that, that gets thrown about um, so easily and so so readily. Um, and that's what people are are chasing. And, you know, for that particular, you know, for that particular role, you know, my job is to help them to be successful inside the organization or set them up for success outside of the organization. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. As long as they're learning and they're developing, um, that's the uh, that's the biggest part. Um I've taken up so much of your time. Uh, we are running out. But before we do that, um, what is next uh, for you guys at uh, Byte Plus? What are you guys doing? Are you growing? Um, are you hiring? What's exciting about you guys right now? Yeah, so we are we are scaling the business uh, extremely uh, fast. So when I came in uh, just over a year ago, I had uh, four people in the team. I think by the end of uh, this year, uh, I will have uh, 20 people uh oh. directly uh within the region so we have uh been able to you know bring some key roles uh into the organization uh for us at the moment we are taking uh six different products to market all at the same time uh mm -hmm. none of them have got to product market fit so the challenge is how do you get six products uh all to product market fit uh get them to to scale mm -hmm. um and to, to move the, the the business forward whilst trying to really define what it is we want to be, you know, what, what is our mission? What is our vision? Uh, how are we going to get there? Um, and how do we get the product into a position where people find it extremely valuable? Uh, it starts to be impactful within their business uh, and they can start to see uh, the outcome and the results that that product has been able to, to help generate for them. Um, so there's, lots of different challenges from taking a, a company from nothing uh, yeah. and trying to move it forward at pace um, because that's the that's the culture and that's the the legacy of the the organization is about moving as fast as you possibly can um, so it's a it's a unique challenge it's an interesting challenge uh, it's something that I haven't experienced before um, so there's uh, lots of uh, lessons to be learned and and it does come back to that uh, that problem solving piece is uh, we're going to we're facing so many different problems every single day. And it's just about how do we keep uh, overcoming those problems, testing and learning, trying to find out what works, what doesn't work, keep improving, keep moving forward. And hopefully, you know, we we'll get to the goals and the outcomes uh, that we're looking to achieve over the next three to four years like it and, and i guess once uh summer's out of the way you're going to be uh, has any conversation started about next year i mean you've gone from four to 20 in that period of time which is which is will be great if you get there um will it be about bedding in or will it be keep on going 
Uh, so it's going to be it's going to be keep on going. We've just had the mid year review where we've just reviewed uh, how we're performing against the goals that we set at the beginning of this year. Uh, this is where I get to ask for more headcount if I if I if I need to, uh, and just finalise the budgets, and then we'll go through the whole process again uh, in October time and and looking at okay what do we need to have in the business for next year in order to to grow again. Yeah. Uh, um, so you know the targets this year around three thousand percent growth. You know they're probably gonna they're gonna double again. You know next year. So it's you know we're gonna have to plan uh, or use that time in October to plan properly so that actually by the end of next year we can start to realize uh, that ambition at the same time. Like it, awesome. Well, uh, well, look, um, Liam, I really appreciate you taking time out to uh, to chat today. Uh, I think the audience will learn a lot, both from uh, on the founders' perspectives um, uh, from starting a business and exiting out to um, uh, the the framework that you have um, in play. There, I think hiring has never been so challenging um and has probably never been so critical um that it is right now so thank you uh, so much for sharing your thoughts and how you do things thanks very much thanks for having me if you like what you've heard today please rate review and subscribe we want you to get involved with tech sales craft and become part of our growing community thanks for joining us